Well, hello. Like Michael just said, my name is Dan Ott. I'm a developer here at Planning Center. And I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk about GitHub Pages, which just as we get started, I'm curious, how many people have published a site using GitHub Pages? Looks like about half of you. Um, how many people have published a site using Squarespace or WordPress or any other tool? All right, that about covers almost everybody in the room. Um, GitHub Pages, at its essence, is free web hosting with a CDN that comes with your GitHub account. And it's a really low barrier to entry to get an idea online if something like acquiring a server was holding you back. So I kind of want to start with this idea of sharing information, of why do we put a website online? It's because we have an idea we want the rest of the world to know about. And just so you know where I'm coming from and my history of tools publishing online, I remember my first idea was I was 15 years old, I was a high schooler in Kentucky, and what we did with our free time was we pulled our money and rented WWF pay-per-view events. Now, I'm talking WrestleMania, SummerSlam, Hell in a Cell, Royal Rumble, this was our free time. And if you've ever watched one of these events, you know that there's about two or three headline matches that are really exciting, and the rest is just filler to justify the huge price that you had to pay. So what we did with the filler matches was we had our own matches. And this was the first thing that I turned to my friend Justin and we were like, the world needs to know about this. They need to know about our characters and our storylines and who's the champion and who are the tag team champions. We need to put this on the web. So we went to, it was probably Yahoo at the time, and typed how to build a website and arrived at GeoCities. <laughs> And I still remember my workflow. I had my huge Hewlett Packard tower, and on my Windows desktop, I had a bunch of Microsoft Notepad files that were all raw HTML, no syntax highlighting. And the workflow was to take that file, copy a bunch of the common HTML to another Notepad file, take those files, try to upload them to GeoCities, and half the time I'd have to start all over because somebody in my house would pick up the phone and my dial-up connection would be dead. And I think my mom is watching the stream, so hi, mom. Thanks for getting me an internet connection so I could get started. So that was my first time publishing back in GeoCities. And of course, the tools got better on the, along the way. Um, a lot of people raised their hand for WordPress. I, of course, used this tool and then tried other tools like Expression Engine. I even at one time had this idea of I was going to take Tumblr templates, which are made for you know, posting just the same pictures of a type over again and making a full website out of it. And it didn't really work out. And I'm just curious, of those who build sites on WordPress, how many people enjoy building sites on WordPress? No hands went up. I'm taking mine down, because I don't enjoy it. And that's not to say it's a bad tool. Like, it's super, <laughs> you can be super productive with it. Um, people that can use that tool have work lined up for years, because everybody wants a WordPress website. And as I battled with not liking this tool, I kind of boiled it down to there's two problems that tools like WordPress or Expression Engine or Squarespace solve that I needed a new solution for. And the first was authentication, which is simply, can the right people write to this website? You don't want people controlling your content, unless you're Wikipedia, which is a different set altogether. Uh, the second problem was transformation. Of I have these little small, unpolished gems, and I want them to go into a full site, have consistent layout, consistent style, make it all look pretty. So those are the two problems I kind of look at as I'm thinking about GitHub pages, authentication and transformation. So first, let's talk about the authentication story. And I want to start by, again, I sound like I'm picking on WordPress, but let's think about all the layers of authentication you have to set up to get a site going. First, you have to find a server somewhere that you're going to pay for hosting. The second was you need MySQL access, which has a username and a password. Third. You had to have FTP access so you could get that initial bundle uh, uploaded to your file server. And then fourth, you'd invariably need shell access, which for some reason was different than FTP access because you'd have to change file permissions to upload files on every single install. And the last was WordPress itself. You, know, you had to go into the PHP admin interface, create your account, create accounts for your collaborators, create accounts for your clients, and so on. Compared to the GitHub pages story, which is your GitHub account. If you have an account on GitHub, you're already set up for GitHub pages. So how do GitHub pages themselves work? And there are two different types of pages. There's account pages, and there are project pages. 
So account pages can be either for an organization or your individual account. So let's take a look at Planning Center's GitHub pages. So the convention that GitHub uses is you have your account name, in this case Planning Center, .github.io. So we see that name matching right there. And <clears throat> you just push to the master branch of that repo, and this will be what's translated to your GitHub pages. And if you look at this repo, you see there's not a lot going on. There's index.html, some asset folders, kind of standard stuff you'd see for a static website. And if you went to planningcenter.github.io, this is what you'd see, no surprise, just static files from a GitHub repo being made avail available publicly. So that was an account page. It's that matching your account name as the subdomain .github.io. Project pages are a little bit different. You see here we're still looking at the Planning Center organization, and it's a repo called API Docs. And there's a little simple mapping of the account name, or in the, yeah, the organization name in this case, is the subdomain, as we'd expect. And the repo is just the first URL segment of the URL. And if you went to planningcenter.github.io slash API docs, you would see this website publicly. And the one thing to call out that's different is when you're working with your account or organization, we use the master branch. But if you're working with a project, the chances are most likely the master branch is going to already be that project. So if you're doing like a Ruby gem or a node module, master is going to be that actual project code. So GitHub uses this convention of the gh-pages branch. So if you push to this branch, it'll be made available publicly. And this is what you'd see if you went to that URL. So those were account pages for an organization. And really quick, we'll look at for an individual account. So this is my account, danot, and danot.github.io. But if you went to this URL, you'd actually get redirected to danot.co. And this is a little feature of GitHub pages to point out, which is you can use a custom domain name. And the way you do that is you just create this file called CNAME. And so the contents of this file are just danot.co. And GitHub handles all the redirects for you. You don't have to do anything special. The one caveat I want to mention of this is the github.io URLs are encrypted by default. If you're using a custom domain, you won't have that encryption. So if that's important to you, you'll need to put another layer in front of it, which there are ways to do pretty easily. So that was the authentication. And it was a lot simpler than setting up your own server with FTP and shell access. And you can kind of, if you've worked in the GitHub ecosystem, you can see the power of this, of if you wanted to have a friend contribute to your site, you just add them as a collaborator on the repo. Or like if you were an agency doing client work and you had a customer who had an NDA, you could just create a team within your GitHub organization so only the right people have access and you're not messing around with WordPress logins. So, so far, we've seen that it's a great authentication story, but we've just moved static files from a GitHub repo to being made publicly available. And it begs the question of what is the transformation story? Well, GitHub, by default, uses a tool called Jekyll. And Jekyll is one of those tools that does what it says on the tin. It's a transform your plain text into static websites and blogs. And this is jekyllrb.com, which is their documentation is great. It's one of those tools that's very simple on the surface layer, but you can dive in pretty far to get into customization. And I'd call attention to this piece at the bottom that says get up and running in seconds. So we install the Ruby gem, we create a new project, and then we CD into the folder, which I did for us. And we can see all the files that Jekyll knew generated. And you see a distinction immediately of there's these files with a leading underscore and files without a leading underscore. And there's kind of two big rules to learn about Jekyll the first time you're using it. And it is, the first is files with a leading underscore are ignored. So in that copying of a file from the repo to being made available publicly, underscore files are going to be ignored. The rest of the files will either be copied directly or go through a transformation before they're copied. And we'll see how that's done here in a second. One of those files is config.yaml. If you're not familiar with YAML, it's a simple key value format for storing configuration in most cases. 
And this file holds configuration for Jekyll, which there's Jekyll command line tools. And if you get tired of typing those same arguments, you can store them in this file, and they'll be inferred automatically. You can also store global data. So if you know in your site you're going to be using your Facebook URL all over the place, instead of copying and pasting that everywhere, you can make it available as some global data. The post directory is where you will put your posts, no surprise, if you're using the blogging capabilities of Jekyll. And your posts just need to follow this simple format of year, month, day, and then a dasherized version of your title. There's a SAS directory, which is one of those things that Jekyll provides out of the box, which is compilation from SAS to CSS. I haven't used this because it's a newer version. It's in newer versions of Jekyll, but it's kind of cool to know it's there. And now, that was kind of a flyby of the underscored files. And let's look at index.html. And we see some things that look like HTML in here, but there's some other bits that aren't as familiar. And we'll just start at the top and look at this layout default. So this triple dash and then layout default and then triple dash is what Jekyll refers to as YAML front matter. So YAML, like I said, key value configuration. The key is layout. The value is default. And this is the second bit of Jekyll that's important to know. The underscores are what was ignoring files. It's the presence of Jekyll front matter that triggers a transformation. So if we had this file without the Jekyll front matter, it would just be copied over directly. But it's these triple dashes, YAML, triple dashes, that triggers the transformation. And then the other bits that don't look like HTML in here are what are called liquid tags. And liquid is a templating language built by Shopify. So if you've ever built a store using Shopify, you'll already be familiar with liquid. And I wish we could go into all the power of liquid, but that's a whole other talk for another night. So that front matter mentioned the default layout, which is found in layout's default. And <clears throat> this is starting to look more like a full HTML document. We've got our doc type, our opening HTML and body tags. We see some more liquid. That content liquid tag is where the content of index.html is going to be put out after it's transformed. And include head.html is one of those liquid tags that does exactly what it sounds like it's going to do. It includes another file called head.html. So those include files are stored in your underscore includes directory. And in this case, it's just a simple HTML head element. And you can kind of see some liquid tags for displaying different titles based on what page is being transformed. So lastly, let's look at about.markdown. And just like index.html, it has this YAML front matter at the top triggering the transformation. And then it's just markdown, which will be converted into HTML. So that is the transformation story that just comes out of the box with GitHub pages using Jekyll, which, of course, begs the question of, what if you don't want to use Jekyll? You know, you might want to use a different static site generator, or you're building something that doesn't even need transformation. You just have a raw HTML file. And the same way that CNAME was a special file that gave you a custom domain, if you create a dot no Jekyll file, none of the Jekyll transformations will happen. So what about the d development story? Like We've talked about authentication. We've talked about transformation. And without even really mentioning it, we talked about our deployment story of you just put push to a GitHub repo. And development is pretty easy, thanks to GitHub providing an aptly named GitHub Pages gem. So if you create a gem file, put this in it, you have the exact same dependencies that GitHub Pages has in production on your local machine. And you would run this command, which is Jekyll serve. You'll want to use the double dash safe option. This makes sure that only the plugins that would be available in GitHub pages are running on your local machine. And then watch will watch your file system for changes to files and regenerate your site locally, which will be served at localhost port 4000 by default. So I've talked about all the good parts of GitHub pages and Jekyll. But I think it's also important to mention the constraints. And if you're using WordPress in a way where comments are important to you, those are going to be something that is not available out of the box because we're doing a git push, transformation happens, and then it's just a static site available. And things like contact forms, like you might have on a Squarespace site, you'll need another solution for that. And there's things like form keep that 
offer this up for you, but again, not out of the box. Um, one thing I always run into is scheduling future posts. So I've done creative solutions where I've like written a cron job that will re-push the repo to trigger the transformation. So that's kind of everything I wanted to do. I know that's a quick, super high-level flyby, and there's a lot of things to dive into, like YAML and liquid tags, but I wanted to leave time for any questions that might be out there. Yes? Uh, one nice trick I've just discovered with GitHub pages is if you name a file 404.html, it'll route every route to that page, so then you can put like a React or an Angular you know, single page app up on there and it'll, it'll still work. Yeah, that's, so. yeah, I'm, I should have mentioned that. That is a really cool thing, especially for the single page app story. Anybody else? So what storage capabilities, what storage capabilities are there? Are they just limited to whatever you have in the GitHub account? Yeah, so the question was what storage capabilities are there? Um, I personally have not pushed the limits of this, and I've always wondered if I'm going to get like a hand slap email from GitHub. Um, and I've done a little research to try to see that when I was thinking about moving my site over there, and I couldn't find any scenario where people were talking about the limitations. I'm sure there would be with like licensed content and probably file size, but I haven't heard any stories personally. Kevin, there's a question way in the back. <laughs> what was the name of my wrestling character? Second part of the question, were you ever the champion? Okay, second part of the question is, was I ever the, question, ever, ever the champion? Oh, I don't remember my individual name, but I remember my friend Justin and I were named High Frequency, F-R-E-K-1-C. Um, and we, of course, did the, the hardcore championship, which is the big kind of wrestling at the time. So we had a ladder match, which I got knocked off of and went through a table. And, but I, I grabbed the belt right as I went through the table. <laughs> Man, glory days. Anybody else? Cool. Well, I'm at Dan Ott on most things. And just thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Give Dan a hand.